it's almost exam time, so from your school, here is Mrs. Smith to quickly give us some words of encouragement. Good luck. Whoa, that really was quick. It's time for maths with Mr. Thomas. We have made it to the end of the trigonometry and bearings chapter. You should be able to answer every single question in past papers or any exercises, any textbooks to do with trig and bearings. But if you have maybe forgotten anything, this is a quick review lesson. Remember, similar to all the other review lessons, I don't go into a lot of detail. I don't give you much of an explanation. I'm just skimming over the key points. If you want more of an explanation, if you want to see more examples, look back to the individual lessons where I will talk through everything in a lot of detail. But as I said, just summing up trigonometry and bearings, here are the key points. So we started off with just some Sokatoa revision from National 4. And we were looking at the different sides, the hypotenuse, the adjacent and the opposite. Hopefully you can name them absolutely fine if you have a right angled triangle and a given angle. There was an example with that where I gave you different triangles. I gave you X, the angle, and asked you to fill out the opposite, adjacent, and hypotenuse. And you were amazing at that. You were so good. Well done. We then looked at sine X, which is the opposite over hypotenuse. Cos X was the adjacent over the hypotenuse. And tan X was the opposite over the adjacent. And we then used that in order to work out the size of the angles or the lengths of the sides. For example, this one here, work out the size of angle X. What we do first of all is just label the sides. So our opposite would be opposite our angle. The hypotenuse is opposite the right angle and the one beside the angle is the adjacent. We were then ticking off the sides that we knew when we wrote down Soka Toa to decide which one had two ticks and which one we were going to be using. We then write down cos x equals adjacent over hypotenuse and we could work it out from there. Again, look back to the individual lesson if you want more detail with that. There were also other ones where we would multiply. So for this one here, we were having to work out the opposite and we had the hypotenuse. So because we were working out O, we had S and H beside one another. And because we were beside, we multiplied. So it's the hypotenuse times by the sine of the angle, which we've got just there. And we had other ones as well with this one here. It was a tan that we were using, but it was the adjacent we had to work out. So because it was the adjacent, it's going to be the opposite divided by the tan of the angle. Again, look back to the individual lesson if you want some examples with that. I also gave some problem solving style questions that you sometimes see. Uh, the likes of this one here, you've just got to isolate the triangle, fill out any missing sides and then use trigonometry to work out your answer. We then went on to look at the area of a triangle, a non-right angled triangle such as this. And in order to work out the area of any triangle, you can use this formula. The area equals a half a B sine so. You do indeed good. A and B are the two sides, either side of the angle which you are given. We looked at some examples with that. There is an example here. We've got this angle is 30 degrees. We know the sides either side of it. So when we've got a half AB sine C, A and B are the sides, sine C, C is the angle. So work out sine of the angle and then multiply it by the half AB to get our answer. You can see here, this is example nine. I'm not going over all the examples. This is just a quick recap of everything that you need to know. But this type of question is very common in the exam where they'll give you a shape that is made up of triangles such, such, blah, 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 such as this hexagon here. You can see that it's just six of these triangles. So for this here, we just had to work out the area of one triangle and multiply it by six. Again, a very common exam style question. After that, though, we then looked at the questions where we're given the area. So with example 10, I said the area is 1,486. Work out the size of the angle. And in order to do that, we just really had to work backwards. We start with the same formula, area equals a half AB sine C, but we sub in what we know. So we know the area, we know the half, we know the two sides, the 50 and the 80, and it's the sine of the angle that we're wanting to find. So we can simplify this. We can divide by the 2,000. That gives us the sine of the angle and then do sine to the minus one to get our answer. Once we looked at the area of a triangle and we mastered that, I gave you a high five. Yay! Well done. And we moved on to look at the sine rule. Sometimes 
Sokatoa is not going to work, and it doesn't work if you have a non-right angled triangle. But we can still work out angles and sides. And one way to do that is by using the sine rule. The sine rule uh, to work out the length of a side is A over sine A equals B over sine B equals C over sine C. And remember, for the sine rule you need pairs! You always need pairs! You do indeed, you have to look for your pairs. And when I say pairs, I mean there is an angle and it's paired up with the side across from it. There is another angle and it's paired up with the side across. Whenever you use the sine rule, start with what you want to find. Here, because you want to work out x, hello, you start with that. So it'll be x over the sine 34 will equal, and then look for your other pair, side in the top if you are working out a side. So 9 over sine 78. And you can rearrange all that to get your answer. We then flipped the sine rule upside down to work out the size of an angle. Remember, this is given in the formula sheet in the exam. This here, woo, this one. Uh, but this one is not. Uh, all you've got to remember is if you're working out an angle, you flip the sine rule upside down. So you get sine A over A equals sine B over B equals sine C over C. So the likes of this example here, we're wanting to work out the size of that angle. And because it's an angle we are wanting to find, we put the angles on top, so a sine of this angle. So sine x over the 75 would equal the sine of this angle over this side. And then from there, you can rearrange that to work out what sine x is going to be, and then do sine to the minus 1 to work out the size of your angle. Remember, this is just a quick recap. If you want more of an explanation and see more examples, look back to the lessons. We also had some ambiguous cases. Ooh, ambiguous, what does that mean? Well, it's when there's more than one answer. And there's more than one answer sometimes when we use the sine rule. You can see here for these two triangles, this angle is 31 and this angle is 149. But they give us the exact same thing. If you do the 9 divided by sine of 31, and the 9 divided by sine 149, it's the same thing. So the trick is, if you are reading the question, it says work out the size of the obtuse angle, what you do is you'd work out the acute angle first of all, and then just take it away from 180 degrees. It's a problem that only pops up for the sine rule when you're having to work out the size of an angle. So work out the size of the acute angle, and then take it away from 180. So instead of an answer being 31, it would be 149. If you look at this example here, it says calculate the size of the obtuse angle ABC. So once again, you just worked out the size of the acute angle. So you get the size of the acute angle, but because you know it's obtuse, take it away from 180. So it'll be 180, take away that, uh, giving you the obtuse angle. Watch out for that, but as I said, it'll say in the question, here it says calculate the size of the obtuse angle. After we mastered the sine rule, I gave you another high five. Yeah! And we looked at the cosine rule. The sine rule uh, works when you have pairs, but sometimes you do not have pairs. For example, here we do not have enough pairs, so the sine rule does not work. Instead, though, we can use the cosine rule. And the cosine rule to work out the length of a side is this. It's a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cos a. And again, in our formula, the lowercase letters represent sides, and the capital letters represent the angles. Yeah. So, an example here, work out the length of side x. Because this is the side we want to find, this here will be our a in the formula. Meaning, if that's a, the other sides will be B and C, and it doesn't matter which one's which. You could swap the B and the C around. It makes no difference whatsoever. I can't swap that around. Oh, no. There we go. So the B and the C, doesn't matter which one's which, but that's what we want to find, which means then cos of the angle, cos of this A, that there is going to be angle A. Watching the exam, they will give you different letters to try and confuse you. Ignore the letters they're giving you and just apply the formula to the question. But that is how it's done anyway.
With this one here, it was a non-calculator question. Sometimes what they'll give you in the exam in the non-calculator paper is the likes of this question here, but it'll give you the cos, or if it was a sine rule question, the sine of an angle. So here it tells us that cos C is, so it gives us the cos of that angle and tells us that it's one fifth. Let's be all freak out because they're like, how do I work our cos of one fifth? But it's not to do with that. It tells you the cos of this angle is a fifth, which means when you apply it to the formula, Again, the letters they give you will be there to try and confuse you, uh, but you're wanting to work out the length AB. So this is what you want to find. So that's really X or AB, call it whatever you want. But that's what you want to find. So if you're using this formula, you're imagining that there is A then, meaning that this angle is the A in the formula. So the cos of the A is really your cos C, and cos C is a fifth. So we're replacing cos C with a fifth, not cos one fifth. And to check that you can do that without a calculator. We then looked at the cosine rule to work out the size of an angle. And to work out the size of an angle, it's just the other formula rearranged, but it's also given on the formula sheet. So to work out the size of an angle with cosine rule, it's cos A equals B squared plus C squared minus A squared over 2BC. Woo! So that was how you would use it. There's an example there. You work out cos of your angle. Once you've got the cos of your angle, to get just your angle on its own, do cos to the minus one of that previous answer, and you'll get the size of the angle. Woo, it's all that easy. It is, but this video is just in case people forget how it's done. It's a quick recap. Then we went on to look at lesson 10, which was the sine rule and the cosine rule mixed together. There are four different formulas. Remember, you are given three of these in the exam. This one you are not given, but it's dead easy to remember because it's just the sine rule flipped upside down. So if you want to work out the size of an angle, you put the angle on top. If you want to work out the length of a side, you put the sine or side on top. And there's cosine rule for an angle and a side. So you've got them as well. Which one do you use though? Well, look at the question. Look at your triangle. And the way I remember it is, I always think about the cosine rule first. Use the cosine rule if you use it if you know all three sides, or if you know two sides and the angle between them. Fiona, you're right, yes. So use cosine rule if you know all three sides, or if you know two sides and the angle between them. And the sine rule, Mark? Oh, for the sine rule, you look for pairs. You do indeed, yeah. Remember, a pair is the angle and the side across from it. So with this example here, calculate the size of the angle marked X. Well, first of all, I'd be thinking about the cosine rule. So use cosine rule if you know all three sides. Well, you don't know all three sides. Or if you know two sides and the angle between them. Again, you don't. So we know it's not cosine. So it's the sine rule that you would use. And because it's an angle, it's the sine rule for working out the size of an angle. But this one here, again, use cosine rule if you know all three sides. You do know all three sides, so straight away, cosine rule. Uh, it's working out the size of an angle, so it's cosine rule for an angle, which is this formula here. We also have a question like this, a problem solving question to do with that. So it's not obvious what you're doing. This would be a question towards the end of a paper. It's more of a level A type question. It is harder, but you had to work out the length of a sloping side first of all in order to get the height. Because once you've got a sloping side, once you know that, you can isolate that triangle. So you could isolate this little triangle here. So you'd isolate that triangle, and once you've done that, well, it's a right angled triangle. So once you've got the right angle triangle, you can just go back to your basic Sokatoa to work it out. To work out the height. Woo! After that, we went on to look at bearings. Bearings! Oh, I hate bearings! Lots of people say they don't like bearings, so I tried to split this down into small bite size chunks. Remember, bearings always measure from north in a clockwise direction and written as three figures. You do need to know everything about angles, so think back to first year, second year when you were dealing with angles and think about your basics. Remember, if you're wanting the bearing of A from B, well, because it's from B, that's where you're wanting to start. So you'd start there, you'd have your north line in, and you're looking at the size of that angle round to the line that would be pointing towards A. If you're wanting the bearing of B from A, well, if it's from A, that then is where you'd be starting. So you're drawing a north line, and then it's north right the way around to that line that points towards B. 
You can look at the example if you're wanting more of an explanation, but it did that with the different points, so the bearing of C from D, D from C, and so on. Uh, with this one here, the bearing of E from F, and then F from E. Again, pay particular attention where it's from, because that's where you're starting, that's where you're imagining you are standing, and then you're turning around from north to face the other letter. There were four examples with that, just kind of covering the basics. Hopefully that made sense. Have we look back at it if you're unsure? But then we went to filling out as many angles as you can. Uh, so we were working out the bearings in here. But as I just said, fill out as many angles as you can first of all. So once you filled out as many angles as you could, it became then quite easy to work out the bearings of A from B, B from C, C from B, and so on. Uh, you could work that out. Again, look back at the lesson if you want me to go through this in more detail. But then what we did to finish off was we looked at bearings, but we were applying trigonometry to those questions as well. So the likes of this question here with the ferry and the trawler, it's to do with bearings, we're given a triangle, but you can see from the answer, we had to use the cosine rule in order to work out the size of one of the missing angles and then use our knowledge about bearings in order to work out what the answer was. With this other example, uh, again, we had bearings, we would draw out what that looked like, we'd use the information, and then again, it was gonna be the cosine rule. Again, if you want me to talk through this in more detail, if you want to see some more examples, look back to that lesson and try the examples there. But once we did that, we then went on to look at some past paper exam questions. This is when I was covering some trigonometry and bearings questions that have popped up in exams in the past. So you may wish to look back at this and just check that you can answer the exam style questions. Some of them are level C, some of them are level A, some of them are B, uh, but there's a mixture of different questions there for you to try. As I said though, that has been a very quick review of the trigonometry and bearings chapter. Hopefully you are remembering everything, but if there's anything you have forgotten, and if you want more of an explanation, look back to these lessons. Go into the lesson and I'll hit you with a lot more detail and a lot more examples to bring you up to the level you need to be at. But best of luck if you want to practice any of these questions. There's some in the Zeta Maths book, there's some in the TJ Maths book. Zeta book's pretty good. Uh, page 233 is the review exercise there. Might want to give that a shot. Best of luck anyway. And remember, past papers. Try past papers. Check if you can do them. There's been more since this video has been made as well. And I haven't put in every single past paper question. So there are others for you to try. Best of luck for the exam when it comes. Let me know how you get on. Bye.